Just feel his love. Take it in. Take it in. Oh, his love, his love. Just feel his love, feel his love.
John chapter 16, and uh, let's get to the word. Verse 30. Now, we are sure that you know all things. Now, this is, these, this is the disciples, and they're speaking this to Jesus. We are sure that you know all things. How many of you are sure this morning that Jesus knows everything about you? He knows your ins, your outs. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows where you're going to be 20 years from now, 10 years from now, you know, 100 years from now. He knows all those things. And if he knows where you're going to be, don't you think he knows what it's going to take to get you to where you're going to be? So he's working all things out. The Father has been working. Remember, Jesus said, the Father has been working until now, and I am working. So we know that's true. Now we are sure that you know all things and you have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Now that's a big statement right there. The disciples are making like a testimony there. They're saying, we believe that you came from God. I heard someone say, I don't know how many years ago they said, either Jesus is exactly who he said he was and is, or he's the biggest liar to have ever lived on planet Earth. You talk about a hoax. That would be the unbelievable hoax that he pulled on mankind. So you're going to have to believe one or the other. Either he's true or he's a liar. How many of you believe he's true? Let God be true and every man a liar. And in this text, the disciples are settling the issue once and for all. They say, we believe that you are exactly who you say you are. Now, Jesus is going to um, question them. Verse 31. And Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Now, think about this. They just said, we believe that you are who you are. We believe you can do all things. You know all things. And then he turns around and says, now, do you believe now? What's he saying? He's saying, okay, I hear your, your confession of your faith. But will you believe when things get difficult, when things get hard, when all of a sudden life takes a sudden turn that you had not planned on? When something happens, you would have never dreamed would have happened to you. Will you still believe in that hour? Are you still going to confess me before men? Or are you going to back up? fall away, fade off into oblivion. Do you know the Bible talks about there's going to be a great falling away? I mean, if you know that. There'll be many people that professed him that are going to fall away. You don't even have to wait to the falling away. Jesus himself said, there will be many that call me Lord, Lord, but in, they don't really do what I say. And so on that day, when they stand before the Father, I'm going to look at them and say, I never knew you. So we know that's a biblical principle. And so they're asking him this question. Or they're declaring who he is. And Jesus said, do you now believe and will you always believe? Because look in verse 32. This is what's important. Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, and has now come. That you, he's speaking to those who just profess him, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father's with me. Remember that. We'll get back to that later. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But, how many of you are glad there's a but there? I'm really glad for this but. But, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, you remember there's a scripture that says, John 21, it says, I suppose if, if everything Jesus said and taught was written in a book, that even the world could not contain the books that would be written. I mean, if you know that's in the Bible. And is that literal? I thought it. Now, Lord, is this literal? Do you mean you could not fill the entire, every inch on planet Earth no, that's not what he meant, obviously. You've got to read behind the lines. What's he saying? He's saying that there's going to be an ever-increasing revelation of who he is and the works that he will do and will do and has done. You couldn't... You, if you start talking about it, you will never exhaust it all. You'll never get to the finish, uh, the end of the story in this life. And if you did write books, he's basically saying there would be no place to put that book. 
But I heard someone say that if you summed up everything that Jesus taught his disciples, you could sum it up with these four things. So this is what we're going to talk about this morning. Everybody with me? I'm going to look around. If anybody's dozing off, I'm going to, I'm going to come and I'm going to call him to go yank you or something. It ain't going to happen today. I remember, I've told you this, but we had some men, when I was a little boy, they would go to sleep every Sunday. They sat up in the choir. You know, in those days, the choir, they were in their choir loft, and there were four men every Sunday. They would agree with everything the preacher said. You know how I knew? Because they would always nod in their heads. You know, he could have said, oh, you're all going to hell, and those guys would have been, uh, <laughs> you know, nodding or what? You know, I... I used to get a kick out of stuff like that. And, well, anyway, we're not going to let you nod your head. You can, I mean, some of you probably hadn't slept in a week, you know. I don't know where you've been. This may be the only place you can get a little sleep. So go ahead, you know, I don't care. Our spirit had better get more than we can get up here anyway. You know what I mean? More is caught than taught. I learned that a long time ago, too. It's not the messenger. You know, remember the Apostle Paul. This is number one on that list. You remember his main purpose in life? You remember what it was? To preach the gospel. And, but he wasn't trusting in some excellency of speech, lest the cross of Christ should be made void. He trusted in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of the gospel, to convict the people. And to speak to the people. And so we have to trust that in this hour. But there are four things. Okay, now back to where we were. Four things in this life. Jesus said this in many different ways. He used repetition. And I often remind me of myself of this. Jesus used repetition. It's okay if you do it too. But the way Jesus did it, he, he would say things in different ways. Number one, you will have trouble. Did you know he said that? Said that in a whole lot of ways. You're going to have trouble in this life from the beginning to the end, so get used to it. Number two, but you will always have peace. In the midst of the trouble, you will have peace. Number three, in this life, regardless of the circumstances, you can walk in joy. The kingdom of God is peace, righteousness, and what? Joy. You don't have to lose your joy. Now, you can surrender it. A lot of people do. You don't have to. And then the last thing is, as long as life endures, you will never be alone. So I want to look at these four things. The first one he said, Jesus taught them, his disciples, that in this life they would have trouble. Now, look in chapter 16, verse 33 again. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace, but in the world you will have tribulation. Whoever told us we would not have tribulation did not read this verse. In this life you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. There are four things at least that I see that he said. First of all, he said, now these things I've spoken to you. In other words, Jesus had spoken to them about this before. He used repetition. He wanted to remind them. There's another place in the book of John where Jesus said, I've spoken these things to you so that when the time comes, you may remember. Remember what? Remember I spoke them to you so you won't be shaken by the things I said that were coming so that you will stand regardless of what's coming. You'll stand on my eternal word. Does that make sense? So that's the first thing. These things I spoke to you. Then the next thing in the world. Now, we've got to learn this principle. Say this. Say, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. Say it again. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. What does that mean? It means we have a different agenda. We have a different mindset. We have a different, you know, something makes us tick. We have different DNA, a different future. I know the plans I have for you, good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Do you think that verse is going to be marked out of the Bible if coronavirus invades the nation? How many of you think they're going to take that scripture out of the Bible? It's not going to happen. That scripture is going to prevail over anything the world has to offer. 
We're in the world, we're not of it. But we have to have God's mindset, a biblical worldview. I heard this very week, I'm not going to mention his name, he's an NBA player. I, I think he's former. I don't watch the NBA anymore. I, I don't have time. The season is too long. I used to watch Michael Jordan. I liked Michael Jordan. I, when I was a little boy, I wanted, well, actually, I was an older man. When I was a little boy, I would watch Pete Maravich, and I wanted to be like Pete. But when I got older, you know, I wanted to be like Mike, like everybody else. I like basketball, but I don't have time. But this guy said he found out his 12-year-old daughter's transgender. And so I saw the quote, I'm going to have to change my worldview. Now, I thought about that. I know you love your daughter. I understand. We're going to love. Love is going to endure. I'm going to, I would love my 12-year-old daughter. There's just no way. But at the same time, we cannot compromise what God has said about the matter. You know what I'm talking about. It's like the whole nation. There's some kind of demonic thing that's been released to confuse our children. Changing our worldview is not going to change the situation. Standing on God's word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Compromise and saying, well, I understand. I'm going to have to change my worldview. That's not going to do it. You know, what, okay, so you say, well, why do you believe that? Because of what God said. God said in the beginning, I made male and female, men and women. That's it. There's only two genders. There's no three genders. Now, you could argue with God if you would like. You could, listen, God, you're going to have to change your, your view up there. I know you said in Genesis there's male and female. I know you said, even in the New Testament, Jesus said, for this cause a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. I know you said that, but God, we have 36 genders today. We need to alert you so you can change the books in heaven. It's not going to happen. You're not being a bigot if you stand on God's word. You know that if... I know they say, well, you've got to be loving when you tell the truth. But if you don't tell the truth, is that loving? It's not loving. It's not loving at all. You have to choose. You know, it's really amazing today what's happening if you're paying any attention. Russia. Listen. How many of you know what I'm about to say? Russia just, and this was Putin. He just, they're, they're looking at amending their constitution so that it will state in the Russian constitution that marriage is between a man and a woman. And in the constitution, it's going to state that a, there is a father and a mother. I think that's the most amazing thing. Here's one nation running towards God while another nation is running away. I think we may want to take God's stand. You know, the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Your God is the Lord, not because you do what you want to do. You do what God says. Many will say, Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I say. So we're going to have to stand for the truth. And you know it's going to be costly. How many of you know it's going to be costly? You may lose a friend. Well, you may lose family. Somewhere along the way, Jesus said that if you come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, right? Okay, we better get on. You, everybody with me now? Anybody sleeping? Look to the guy or the gal next to you. Is anybody asleep? Nobody. Okay, the next thing is, these things I've spoken to you that in me, in the world. Now, this is interesting. The word will. You will have tribulation. You go look it up. The word will is not there. Some of the versions. Maybe they put it there to make us feel better. But it's not there. It actually says, in this life you have. It's not, this is not a future thing that you possibly could face. This is a present reality where you live on planet Earth every single day. So what are you going to do about it? You're going to do what the rest of the scripture says. You're going to overcome it. That's what he says. You, in this life, you have tribulation. 
You know that scripture, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved. How many of you are the beloved? Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you, ought, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, the word tribulation, tribulation means pressure, compression. It means squeezed. You ever felt squeezed in where well, there's no way out? Affliction. That song we sung, he shares with us in our afflictions. Distress of mind, distressing circumstances, trials, tribulation, and trouble. Now back to verse 33, it says, But be of good cheer, be of good courage, be confident, be hopeful, be bold. Maintain a bold bearing. That's what that means. You should look. There should be an expression on your face. That though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not fearing any evil. For I know who's with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And you can stand on all the promises of God. Now look at this real quick, John chapter 6. You know, this is a crazy time. I have always felt in my life that every message I preach, I always feel, God, this is like a word for right now. For this hour. I always felt that. I hope I never lose it. It's not like you're just going to class and repeating a message. You know, a teaching that you taught 20 years ago. You should preach as if you're preaching the very oracles of God. I've always believed that. Maybe I'm old school or abnormal. Well, I want to stay abnormal. Abby normal. I'm going to hang up and I'm going to stay in that, that lane. But I believe you're going to need this word. Just like last week on that word on coronavirus. I believe we're going to need it. I hope this, all I'm saying is, God, the more I've come along this journey, the weaker I feel and the more I really think. I, the things I thought I knew, I don't really know at all. I just know Him. I'm learning to become more confident in Him. Does that make sense to anybody? You think I know what to do if coronavirus... All I know is what God said to do. And I'm going to do what God said to do. Now, John chapter 6. This is, now, this is good. Verse 56. Jesus makes an outlandish statement. It shocks all of those that are in attendance that day. He says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Verse 57, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. How many of you think that might have shocked some of the people at the local first synagogue on that, that morning? Hey, you want to live, you got to eat and drink my flesh. Drink my blood. No, you can't drink his flesh. Eat the flesh, drink my blood. You don't have any part of me. They thought he'd lost his mind. They thought he was absolutely, had gone crazy. And then he begins to explain in verse 58, this is the bread he's trying to get over. It's not about anything in the natural. There's the natural, but there's a spiritual principle. And he says, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your father ate, not like the manna that they ate, and they're dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. And he called himself the bread of life, right? So who's he talking about? Eating the bread, the Word. I am the Word. Jesus said, I am the Word. He was the Word. It is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. So he's talking about a spiritual principle. And these things he said in the synagogue as he taught them. Verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, Jesus, this is a hard saying. This is difficult. Who can understand it? This is really difficult, Lord. I don't know if I can handle that. I'm not, going, I'm not sure I'm going to go that far. Look at verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Now, that's interesting. They got offended. They were grumbling. They were murmuring. I want to give you, before we get to the rest of this, a caution. This is not the hour to grumble, murmur, and complain. 
I should have looked at this verse, but there's a scripture that says, Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And in the context, they were grumbling and murmuring and complaining. That is not the time to be grumbling. It's not the time at all. A whole generation grumbled and they died in the wilderness. Jesus said, these things that were written beforehand, that's one of the scriptures he's talking about. Whatever was written beforehand was written for our example on whom the ends of the ages has come. You might want to pay attention to what was written before. Murmurers and complainers, let me tell you this, will be disqualified in participating in the current move of God that has begun. How do I know that? Well, it's not because they hear God say, okay, you're disqualified. That's not the reason at all. Because God is not into disqualifying. You know how they'll be disqualified? Anybody know? You know? How, Shirley? You stole my thunder. You must have read that before. Because that's exactly what happened. No, thank you for doing that. Let's go to the scripture. Here's what happened. Shirley, that's really good now. You're very, because she did not know what I'm going to preach. This is really good. Look at this. So they say, oh, does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. He's reminding them what he just said to them about eating the flesh and drinking the blood. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now remember, they had believed just a little before. Now there were some who were not believing. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who were only confessing they believed, but they really didn't believe. And they would betray him. Verse 66. This has always been amazing to me. 6, 6, 6. John chapter 6, verse 66. 666. I got to figure out what the rest of that means, but I know it's not a good number. Well, this is what happened. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So that's how they got disqualified. It's not that God said, okay, you're grumbling, you're disqualified. No, their grumbling caused them to back away, back off, let go, turn away, from the purpose that God had for them to walk in. That's why the scripture says many are the called, but few are the chosen. Because there's a price. Verse 69, well, actually 67, Jesus said to them, do you also want to go away? You also want to back up and get out of the limelight, whatever, back away? High, you know, isolate yourself. Also, we have come to believe. They said, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And these are the ones that God used. So, we don't want to crumb, grumble. Listen to this letter. It may take a few minutes. But this is a letter from my pastor in Wuhan, China. The epicenter of the coronavirus. Brothers and sisters, peace be unto you. During these past days, the Wuhan pneumonia virus has been at the center of my thoughts in life. I'm always watching the latest news, thinking about how our family and the church should face this. As for family, I've gathered masks and food. I've ventured out of doors as, as little as possible. When venturing out in public, I've worn a mask. But as for the rest, I have placed it in the Lord's hands. As for the church, the safety of our congregation, a faithful witness, the possibility that members could contract this illness have all become a great area of struggle for me. It is readily apparent that we are facing a test of our faith. The situation is so critical. We are trusting in the Lord's promises that his thoughts toward us are of peace and not of evil. And that he allows for a time of testing not to destroy us but to establish us. Therefore, Christians are not only to suffer with the people of this city, but we have a responsibility to pray for those in this city who are fearful and to bring them to the peace of Christ. First, we are to seek the peace of Christ to reign in their hearts. 
Christ has already given us his peace. But his peace is not to remove us from disaster and death, but rather to have peace in the midst of disaster and death. Because Christ also overcame these things. Otherwise, we have not believed in the gospel of peace. And with the word, with the world, would be terrified of pestilence and lose our hope in the face of death. Why do only Christians have this peace? Because of sin, humans deserve the trials and tribulations they've, that come upon them. Jehovah says, the wicked have no peace. We were all sinners, but Christ, because of faith, took our penalty and gave us his peace. Therefore, Christ says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Christians may, with the world, face the same tribulation. But such tribulations are no longer punishment, but a new opportunity to grow nearer to the Almighty and to purify our souls, and to proclaim the gospel. In other words, when disaster strikes, it is but a form of God's love for us. As Paul said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness? All these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm sure that neither death nor life nor anything shall separate us. Spoken for today... Wuhan's pestilence cannot separate us from the love of Christ. This love is in our, our Lord Jesus. These words are so comforting for us. We've already become one body with Christ. We have a part in his sufferings and we have a part in his glory. All of Christ is ours and all ours is Christ. Therefore, Christ is with us as we face the pestilence in this city. If we die in the pestilence, is it, an it is an opportunity to witness to Christ and even more enter into his glory. Thus, my brothers and sisters, I encourage you to be strong. If we more deeply experience death in this pestilence, understanding the gospel, we may more deeply experience his love and grow ever nearer. Our Lord Jesus, through faith, experienced an incomparable suffering of death, yet God raised him from the dead and set him at the right hand. If in reading these truths you still have no peace, I encourage you to diligently read the above scriptures that I've stated. Call on the Lord to give you insight until the peace of Christ reigns in your heart. You must know that this is not just an observable disaster, but even more, it is a spiritual struggle. You struggle, or you should first wage a battle for your heart, and secondly, battle for the soul of our city. We earnestly hope that you would know that not a sparrow falls without the will of the Father. With so many souls facing pestilence, can it be outside of God's will? All that we are experiencing, is, is it not like Abraham facing Sodom and Jonah facing Nineveh? If God, because of a righteous man, withheld judgment on Sodom, or because of 120,000 who didn't know that their left, their left hand from their right what of the city of Wuhan in which we live? We are clearly the righteous in this city, far more than a single righteous person. There are thousands of us, yet many, we like Lot, be grieved all over this city, and like Abraham, who earnestly prayed for Sodom. You see, Jonah, with difficulty, proclaimed the gospel to Nineveh, and Nineveh repented and was saved. We are in this city. We must pray for God's mercy upon our city and bring peace. I believe this is the command of God calling those of us living in Wuhan. We're to seek the peace of the city and seek peace for the medical personnel, for the government, seek peace for all the people of Wuhan. And we can, through online networks, guide and comfort our friends, our loved ones, reminding them that our lives are not in our own hands and to trust in God who is faithful and true. And there's so much more, and we'll try to send that out. But one thing I hear from this pastor in Wuhan is the truth. And he, this is the second thing. I'll go quicker. But the second thing that Jesus promised, number one, you'll have trouble. Just say, I will. No, don't say, in this life I have trouble. But Jesus didn't stop. He said, in this life we're also promised peace. John 14, 25, real quick. Look at 14, 25. These things I've spoken to you while I'm present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Let me just stop right there a moment. 
the comforter, the helper. What, what's another word for, for helper? Comforter, advocate, the comforter. Do you know there are three ways that we're comforted in the, in the time of great trial? Joe and Marla, Joe just lost his dad. Do you know the three ways that we get comfort? First of all, the scripture, we spoke about it last week. In the comfort of the scriptures, we get hope. So it's through the comfort of the word of God. Another way is the comforter, right? The Holy Spirit. You know what the third way is? Does anybody know? They don't tell you this in ministry school. They should tell you this. I've got to read it. I want you to look with me, if you would, real quick. Because it's, um, it's vital that we understand this. First or Second Corinthians chapter 1, real quick. Here's another way that you get comfort. Are you ready for this? How many of you want God to use you in this hour? Are you sure? This should be taught on the first day of ministry school, Bible school. And maybe some of them do, but look at this. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. How? With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, in light of what we just read from the pastor in Wuhan, look at verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation or comfort also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort or your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffered. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. How many of you know what we just read? It says, to the degree that you experience and you walk in and participate in the sufferings in this life and are comforted by God, to that degree you have authority to comfort those who are afflicted in any affliction. That's how God trains His people for ministry. They don't tell us that. They tell us ministry is about the shining lights. No, it's far more. It's about taking up your cross. You ask our brothers in China, they'll tell you the truth. I have a feeling that God is going to redefine the gospel in America from the American westernized gospel that has been preached to the biblical truth of the gospel that is about to be experienced. So peace, we get it three ways. It just happens to fit that way. I'm not always... One, two, three, A, B, C. But this, today, it just happens to fit. Three ways. Number one, he said, my peace. Look in, you read the scripture in John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Oh, wait a minute. You said trouble in this life. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Three things about peace. Number one, it's His peace. If it's His peace, that tells me it is a supernatural peace that God wants to give us in hours such as we live right now. It's not some peace that we can conjure up on our own. I think I'm going to have peace today. No, my peace. He is our peace. How many of you know that? Christ, Jesus, He is my peace. People look for peace everywhere but Him. When you look to Him, you'll find that He is your peace. And then He gives it as a gift. It's a gift. My peace I give to you. And then He emphasizes how He left it with us. He didn't take it away. He's not going to take it away in a time of crisis. 
It'll be the peace of God before the crisis, in the crisis, and after the crisis. How do you know that? How do you keep your peace? Here's a scripture. Look at it later. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose eyes are stayed on you. You look that up. The word perfect is actually the same word peace. He's using a double peace. He will keep him in peace, peace. Whose mind, whose mind is stayed on thee. So the third thing. Okay, you will have trouble. No, you have trouble. We have to train ourselves to eliminate that word will. It's just the way it is. Number two, you have peace. Number three, joy. He's promised joy. Chapter 16 and verse 16. A little while and you will not. Now, you got to get this. You get everybody with me. It's going to take about 10 to 15 more minutes. Maybe not 15. How about 10? Who will give me eight? Eight. Going once. Okay. We got to get this in. You got to have it. You got to know that this is something else he told me. Oh, this is... This is really good. A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Verse 17. A little while and you will not see me. Again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Jesus is saying, it's almost like he's saying, now you see me, now you don't. You ever been that way before? It's like, God, where did you go? Where are you? Why have you left me here all alone? Anybody ever felt that way? God, where are you? What are you doing? How come I don't hear you anymore? Lord, what happened to you? Now I see you, now I don't. This is what God showed me. In this context, what was happening? He had gone to the Father. What did he already tell them in John chapter 16, I think in verse 7, about going to the Father? Anybody? He says it's to you. They ask him, Jesus said, I'm going away. He said, it's to your advantage that I go. If I do not go, I will not send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. He will be with you. So it's to your advantage. Here's what the Lord showed me this week. There will be times in our life we will wonder where God is. As a believer, as a true child of God, you didn't, you didn't commit some unpardonable sin. You may, have, you know, whatever. You're just going through life. You're trusting in God. You're learning to get up again. You get knocked down. You get up again. But there'll be times when it looks like God has deserted you. For a believer, every time you feel like he's deserted you, it is always going to work out to your advantage. Always. Just like it was with Jesus. It's to your advantage. He left them. It was to their advantage. There'll be times you won't hear him as clearly. You will wonder where he is. I'm telling you, he loves you enough. You can Bet your bottom dollar. Whatever it is you're going through, God is working. He has not stopped working. It'll work out to your advantage. When I saw that, it blew me away. What do you mean? Because he's God. And it's the principle of the scripture. It's always to your advantage. That's why the scripture says, whatever thing, all things work together for good. Right? Right? To them that love God, those that are called. Jesus said, my father has been working. And I am working. There are times it seems like, God, you're not working. Oh, he's working. And it's always to your advantage if you're a child of God. I believe, and then you can read, I, I'm not going to read it all, but in verse 19, Jesus knew they desired to ask of him. Are you inquiring among yourselves, what, what did it mean a little while and a little while I'm with you and all this? Most assuredly, I will, now we got to read this. This will lead to the last point. Verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the, and the world, but the world will rejoice. Now, this is a little tricky. He wanted them to understand this. And you will be sorrowful. But, here's another but I'm thankful for. But your sorrow will be turned into joy. I think he's speaking about the cross. There was an enduring, sometimes weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is also a scripture about the end of the age. 
there will be a time when it will look like the wicked are getting away with the crimes they've committed. And it will look like the wicked are being justified and the righteous are being condemned. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It will look like just the opposite. The righteous will go to prison and the wicked will march through the streets celebrating their freedom. Only for a season. Only for a season. And here's what he wanted them to know. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. There was anguish. And for joy, no one... Oh, no, let's go on. Let me read. For joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, now he, every time we see therefore, we have to know what it's there for. So you have to take it in context. He's looking at his disciples. I want to promise you have something, even in the midst of your anguish, even in the midst of trial. Verse 22, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. What's he promising them? Joy, regardless of whatever sorrow will come their way. The kingdom of God is not peace, sorrow. It's joy, peace, joy. It's joy in the Holy Spirit. And that leads us to the third thing. The last one, I'll go really fast. But it's joy, the promise of joy. Listen, he said right there, for joy that no one will be taken from you. Your joy no one will take from you. I want to tell you, there's a joy that no one will take from you. There's a joy no pestilence will take from you. There's a joy no sickness, nothing, prison time, nothing will take from you if you follow Him. The kingdom of God is peace, righteousness, and joy. You only will lose your joy if you surrender it on your own because it's yours to keep forever. Trouble peace, joy, and then that scripture we read earlier where Jesus said in verse 32, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, and now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus was give, given us the key. There will be a time that you may be lonely. You may be lonely. When we came into the world, we, I especially, my wife, they couldn't touch her for what, three months. She was lonely, little bitty, premature. When you leave this world, guess what? You can't take anybody with you. How many of you know that's true? You can't take anybody. On that day, you can try to hang on to loved ones. It's not going to work. You got to cross that threshold on your own. You may be lonely. But the truth is that Jesus taught us you will never be alone. Never will you be alone. What does the promise say? He said in this life, the Lord God is the one who goes before you. And he will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. How many of you know that's still a scripture for us? I will never leave you. You may feel lonely, but you're not alone. You will never Say, I'll never be alone. And if the believers in Wuhan needed, and I know that's what they're hearing, we're not alone. Our God is with us. I pray God raises them up and it sends them like a mighty army across their nation with the power of the gospel, healing the sick, raising the dead. What if God's chosen us for this moment to do the same? Is that not the gospel? Preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Freely you've received. Freely give. What about the end of the age? Here's what he said. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even... And even especially at the end of the age. And Lord, I thank you for the truth of the scripture. I thank you, God, for your word. 
The opinions of men will pass away, but the word of our God will endure forever. And Lord, I thank you that you are building a people whose foundation is the truth. And Lord, I thank you that everything will be shaken that can be shaken except those whose lives are built on the kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. And I thank you, Lord, that China has a mighty church, but so does America. There's a remnant church in America that has been prepared for such a time as this. And I thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace and your love for every nation, Kenya, Singapore and Hong Kong, and Korea, and Japan, France and England, and every nation of the earth will see the glory of the Lord. I thank you, God. You promise that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth just like the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you we get to live in an hour like this. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's a real holiness about this moment. One thing that we have to do, some of us need to quickly repent of murmurings and complaining and grumbling. It will disqualify you and you will think, not, God's not going to show up in your bedroom and say you're disqualified. You will begin to back away and isolate yourself. And you don't know. So we need to repent of any grumbling, murmuring and complaining. If anybody you know, would say, I want to repent and complain because I murmured and complained. <laughs> I want to repent. Would you just raise your hand? We just, he's going to confess. Lord, we confess. Any murmuring, any complaining, anybody. I confess. I'm not looking around. I'm just saying, God, we need help. Thank you. There's forgiveness. If we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to so forgive us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even murmuring and complaining. Thank you. We repent, we confess our sin, and we thank you for the goodness of God that leads to repentance and the forgiveness of the shed blood of Jesus. Thank you, there's nothing we can do to make it right. You made it right on the cross, and you rose from the dead to seal that forgiveness and that victory. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.